Hello and welcome to the Queer Monkey Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the, of the Institute. And along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education and Outreach, we want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, the Queer Monkey Institute is an independent, nonprofit, anthropological research organization committed to expanding consciousness through an ancient practice known as ecstatic transpostures. And it was the insightful work of our founder, anthropologist Dr. Felicitas Goodman, who found the clues, revived the practice, which she found in the world's collection of prehistoric and indigenous art, which she decoded as ritual instructions. So for more information, you're welcome to visit our website, queermongainstitute.com, or a simpler domain name is transpostures.com. That will take you over to our website. As an educational organization, institution, we recognize that to thrive, we want to take an open approach. So we continue to invite scholars of parallel research and related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. We've had so much fun in the last 14, 15 months of discussing discussions, including um, what neuroscience, mysticism, trance states, anthropology, art history, archaeology, archaeoastronomy, shamanism, mythology, and of course the many aspects of our own work in the study and practice of ecstatic trans postures. So from around the world, there's plenty of evidence of how the sun, the moon, planets, stars were a central part of prehistoric societies. And looking across North America specifically, we find an abundance of ancient sites featuring astronomical alignments from Woodhenge in uh, Cahokia, Illinois, through the Kolomakee Mounds in Georgia, the McKeithen site in Florida, in Alberta and Saskatchewan, Canada, and in Montana, the Dakotas and Wyoming. There's over 100 medicine wheels, including that best known one, the Bighorn medicine wheel which all seem to have orientations to track the movement of celestial objects, both as a calendar and also for ceremonial purposes. And here in the Southwest, Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, and its famous Sun Dagger, and many others were created by the ancient uh, Pueblo peoples, and including being surrounded at our own institute in, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We followed the tradition. We built our Hall of Thunderbirds. We have a large labyrinth built to align to the sunrise of the summer solstice. And even the doorway to Akiva, which was built almost 50 years ago, welcomes the rising sun as well. And we went a step further with the installation of a gnomon with the guidance of astrophysicist Tony Hall. We put in a gnomon, which is considered to be the world's oldest astronomical instrument to mark the movement of the sun and provide specific orientation to the directions more accurately than a compass. And there happens to be a site just a few miles away from our home here in Arizona, which is the largest known petroglyph site in the Verde Valley of central Arizona, a rock art site that consists of over a thousand petroglyphs and has its own solar calendar. So I'm excited today and I want to have Laura do a proper introduction. Well, um, I want to just say that before we introduce our guest, that our mission here has been to learn from our ancestors, those who've gone before. And on our Sundays, we've spent a lot of time comparing and contrasting worldviews to better understand that our way is not the only way, and that in many respects, our ancestors had much more sensible, more sophisticated, more beautiful ways of living and of viewing the universe and their place in it. And to truly understand what our guest today has to share, we might momentarily step outside our current paradigm. We are so tied to our devices that measure time for us. Our phones have world clocks, timers, stopwatches, alarms. They're synchronized to beat in time with everyone else's devices. We can measure time down to a nano slice. We know how fast atoms spin. My mother was a first generation Swiss miss where every part of her day was regimented by the hour. Her day was structured not by internal cues, but the external cue of that ever pleasant present clock and what it said to do. We once lived, however, with a very different sense of time. Our biorhythms were tied to the Earth's rhythms. We rose with the sun and we set along with the sun with no artificial sun to disrupt that rhythm. We saw the stars in their full 
dazzling glory every night. We were once tuned to internal cues. We were once tuned to the subtle signals of our immediate environment, the angle of the shadows casting um, by the sun told us the length of the day, mm. the flow of time, once tied to the natural order. Being in right relation with the universe, we aligned with its time, we kept pace with its heartbeat. And we can see how utilizing the very landscape as a timing device is a natural extension of understanding this grand and ultimate timekeeper of the heavens to make visible how it's aligned with that natural order. So a solar calendar as a very key feature of a sacred site makes sense. And we'll, discuss, we'll look at one today. And we have with us the gentleman who decoded a site very close to us here in Sedona. It's quite the detective story. Our guest led the way, decoding a thousand-year-old heritage site, a vertical rock face with over a thousand petroglyphs, to find not only one solar calendar that was still operational, but many such devices in the area. And it is Ken Zoll. He's the founding member and current executive director of the Verde Valley Archaeological Center, located in Camp Verde, Arizona. He's the regional coordinator for the site steward program of Arizona State Parks and Trails. He trains volunteers to monitor archaeological sites in the area. He's conducted extensive field work in ancient astronomical practices of the Southwest. And he's a certified instructor in ancient astronomy field work, the author of several books and articles in professional journals. I have one of them today. Uh, very interesting book. And he currently researches um, meteor fragments from meteor craters that were found at or near ancient dwellings in the Verde Valley. Meteors, gifts from heaven falling down from the sky. So, Ken, welcome. <laughs> Such a pleasure to have you. Paul and I My have spent with you. many visits to the V Bar V heritage site. We bring friends when they drop by. Um, it's, it, it's just a fabulous site. So you are the detective that put it all together. So it's such a thrill to talk with you today. Thank you. We want to hear your personal story uh, before you show us your slideshow so we can all understand the sophistication, what you say, the high tech of the ancient world. How did you begin? Well, I retired out here 17 years ago. And since uh, the V bar V is only 15 minutes from my house, I volunteered right away to be a docent over there, as well as Palaki and, and Honaki, the other Forest Service sites. And uh, they give you basic training uh, about the petroglyphs. Uh, but there were a series of concentric circles. People would often call them bullseyes. And they would always ask about that. And, um, you know, that wasn't covered on our training. So I did some individual research and discovered that it's often referred to as father's son and often used as calendar making. Well, back in Chicago, where I came from, my hobby was astronomy, I belonged to the Adler Planetarium. And my plan was when I retired out here, I was gonna get a telescope and start looking to the dark skies. And uh, when I read this, that there might be a calendar uh, associated with it, that kind of piqued my interest. And I started to watch the, uh, the site a little more closely. And uh, literally within about a month, uh, the equinox arrived and came up with some very unique uh, uh, figures that you'll see. And when I took that into the Forest Service archaeologist and I said, do you think we got a calendar here? Uh, he said, well, I've always been suspicious, but never had the time to check it out. Uh, why don't you check it out for the next year? And, um, and he, it's a locked site, as you know, and they gave me keys to get in there, uh, to get in whenever I needed to. And um, Basically, uh, when I got to the summer solstice and recorded things, March 21st, April 21st, May 21st, now June 21st, I took them back into him and, and he said, can't argue with you, we have a calendar here, but continue for the whole year uh, because there's never been a calendar site found in the Sedona Verde Valley area before. Um, and so I did. And then when I got all done with the 12 months, he and I showed it to him, he goes, well, let's make sure we can replicate this. So we had to reproduce the whole thing for a whole second year uh, mm -hmm. before he would allow me to start talking about it. Um, and then once that happened, um, as you say, V Bar V is a very pleasant place. When I started out as a docent, uh, if I got five, six people show up, 
it was a good busy day. <laughs> uh, now they record at least 150 people showing up every single day, and mostly because of publicity, the uh, the calendar is, is brought to the site. But again, as a result of that, um, the archaeologists said, "Well, why don't you go to such and such a place that's always been suggested, or this place has been suggested?" And then I started getting pioneer families calling me up saying, "Well, when I was a kid, I used to think this was a calendar thing. Why don't you go check this out?" So, and then that led to kind of a uh, pattern as to. Uh, what might constitute a, a calendrical site and uh, started doing more and more. So I'm up to about about 14 calendar sites that have been documented for the to the satisfaction of the archaeologist and um, uh, keep at it. But now, as you said, I've kind of moved on to meteorites and uh, and that's my current area of, uh, of study. Oh, we need to fit that in yeah. as well. But let's focus on the VBRV. It's not only a calendar site. I know that when we took um, our friends Graham and Shelley there, and Shelley's very interested in mm. archaeology and astronomical sites the world over, we sat and watched the sun um, cast the shadow of that vertical napped uh, and tweaked edge, mm -hmm. and it created like a mountain range. And you tie that to the Sinegua's uh, sacred mountain site some distance away and i thought how beautiful to yeah. bring that energy to this sacred site because it was a whole network for this culture we haven't even talked about the culture of right. a thousand years no. ago that created this mm -hmm. so it's right. it's a sacred the, the site shadow, yeah. with a calendar the shadow is basically it's the shadow of the uh, san francisco peaks mountain range and it, it, it's a sliver when we were there investigating and you'll see some slides of that um with geologists they confirmed that uh, that sliver that creates this was not only created because we had the uh, a lithic expert there, um, but uh, it was moved to be in its per in its position to create the shadow, and the shadow only falls within this crevice. And the theory that we have is that the San Francisco Peaks is where the Katsinas reside, and through the uh, uh, symbolically underground caverns they are bringing the the, uh, the casinas into the Verde Valley uh, through this cavern with representation of the San Francisco peaks on there so yeah it's, it's a pretty special little feature yeah cracks and rocks what's fascinating is that there seems to be a vernacular with rock art with petroglyphs with cave walls with faces that seems to be consistent the world over and so cracks in a rock seem to be where the spirits can uh come and go that's, the, yeah. that's their portal mm. yeah so that makes you mentioned the casino and you mentioned the hopi do you want to give us a background to this culture the sinigua and their ties to the current pueblo culture today and that's another way where you went exploring what does this mean you actually went and talked to the elders there uh, right. Uh, the, uh, the the Hopi recognize that the Sanawa culture as uh, their ancestors, and there are a large number of uh, current Hopi clans that trace their ancestry back to the uh, what they call land of the red rocks. And there's some debate as to where exactly that was, but a great many of them claim uh, affiliation with Montezuma Castle, Palaki, Honaki, and a lot of the ruined sites. And so there is a lot of cultural uh, connections. Um, we were gifted 15 acres of land in Camp Verde uh, that was going to be a housing development. And uh, when they were doing their Army Corps of Engineer experiments or investigations, they found a pit house village and in the process uncovered one burial, which stopped everything. And they took care of that the proper way. Uh, but in the process, the donor basically said, I don't want to be bothered with this. There could be more burials here. I'm going to give you the land. So they gave us all 15 acres and we've preserved it as a uh, Native American heritage uh, preserve. And we have a little trail that goes through it uh, that explains prehistoric life. And uh, at least once a year, Hope Elders come down and they bless the site because they're sure there are additional burials there. And so well, we have a, a close connection with, with the Hopi. Um, don't want to get into it, but, but I also researched the Billingsley Hopi dancers that were from Second Mesa back in the 20s and 30s. And uh, I've been up there to Second Mesa a lot because of some of their relatives are still alive. So we've been able to develop a pretty good uh, trusting relationship uh, with, with a variety of uh, the Hopi up there. Thank you for all that you're doing to bring that heritage alive and to help preserve it. I mean, that's that's yeah. huge and it's so necessary. You mentioned the casinas. Do you want to put the casina, casinas in uh, perspective? Well, casinas are, are their spirit helpers. 
Um, they, they don't pray to them. You know, when people ask about them, I usually equate that to uh, the saints in the Catholic Church, where you don't you don't worship the saints. You just ask a particular saint to intercede to God for you for a particular purpose. And the casinos is the same thing. You know, there's casinos for different different purposes, and uh, and, and they call upon them for for different things. So um, it's it's prevalent here. We have uh, uh, a variety of signs uh, that the casino religion had, in fact, reached the the Verde Valley. Uh, we, we have rock art of uh, Katsina faces. We have uh, the Peaky bread um, making slabs. We have uh, architectural structures that changed from the uh, single closed uh, underground kivas to large open plaza structures. So uh, we have a number of, uh, and the pottery, we have the, what they call uh, general yellowware that uh, was used basically for Hopi uh, Katsina ceremonial purposes. So we have a lot of connections to uh, to the Hopi and to the Katsina religion that they had in fact arrived and, and the, which is the prevailing theory as to why did this and I will leave. They basically went up to Hopi basically as a religious migration. So uh, that seems to be the prevailing theory down here. And the Sinequa were farmers. We actually visited the canal that's still working. Mm -hmm. I mean, beautifully constructed canal that fed the fields. Um, and the Sinequa is a Spanish name. Could you tell us a, just a little bit about the, this culture? Well, the Sanawa is uh, actually uh, is a Spanish term, sin agua, without water. Uh, and actually, when the Spaniards first arrived up in the uh, uh, Flagstaff area uh, and they saw the ruins up there, they, they referred to those people as the people without water because they didn't see a lot of water around. And then later, uh, when uh, uh, Harold Colton founded the Museum of Northern Arizona, uh, and he started to look at uh, the different ruins. He picked up on the word and he called the people there the Sanawa or Sanagua, tomato, tomato. People pronounce it different, different ways. But uh, so they, he's the one that named the, the culture up there. And then when he came down to the Verde Valley, he saw similarities in architecture uh, and burial and uh, methods. And so he said, wow, this must be a branch of the Blackstaff, Sanawa. So I'll call them Northern Sanawa and down this in, in the Verde Valley, Sedona area, uh, he called them uh, Southern Sanawa. Um, but basically they're, uh, again, they, they're basically Hopi ancestral groups. And um, there's a great deal of debate uh, still today, whether the uh, Sedona Verde Valley people were really Sanawa. Mm -hmm. uh, there's evidence that there's uh, there's some influence of the Mogollon who are up on the rim. There's some Pataian influences. There's some Holcomb influences. Uh, there's even one site that uh, one archaeologist has argued is a Salado trading post. So um, uh, so it's it's one another big prevailing theory is that the Verde Valley turned out to be kind of a melting pot of all these surrounding uh, cultures. So uh, big debate still. You know, I give talks to classes and kids. I tell them. Uh, if you've got a good imagination and you like doing research, you can come up with a theory and uh, nobody's actually going to prove you wrong. Uh, so if you like to do that, uh, have yeah. fun. One thing we do know, though, is, as you point out in your book, the V Bar V heritage site named for the ranch right. that it was before it became um, a national park, public park, whatever it is. Um, it was a sacred site where people didn't dwell. There's a half mile away 60 room Pueblo, you say, that's where people lived. But sacred sites were purposeful for ceremonies, for the sun watchers to keep track. It had a different purpose than uh, a village site. Do you want to touch on that? And then we should go to- Oh, sure. The, the largest dwelling nearby is about half a mile to the east, which is referred to as Sacred Mountain, uh, not because it's necessarily sacred, that's just what the pioneers called it. But you're right, it is a 60 room uh, Pueblo at the top of, the, of a white bluffed mesa. Uh, there's actually three uh, room blocks of 20 rooms each with a very large open plaza and there's a ball court at the base of it. So that again suggests that it's a, a major site and it's actually surrounded by uh, uh, tens of thousands, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, <coughs> tens of thousands of acres of uh, planting fields. <coughs> And the archaeologist Esther actually refers to that the area around Sacred Mountain as the breadbasket of the Sanao because it was such it was the largest contiguous uh, farm field uh, in the Verde Valley. And uh, but on the property that is the V Bar V Ranch, which as you say was a cattle ranch, that's how it got its name. Uh, there is a small uh, pit house village uh, that a little ways away, but um, 
we think because uh, it's such a large site, it has so many religious imageries there, storytelling images, that uh, it's right on Beaver Creek, so that people from Montezuma Castle, Montezuma Well, uh, a variety of, of dwellings along Beaver Creek would come there for religious uh, ceremonies and observances. Uh, they've tracked that uh, from Montezuma Castle going north, there is a significant dwelling every 1.8 miles along Beaver Creek. So uh, Beaver Creek obviously was a, a, a sort of highway uh, and connecting everything and the Beaver V is fairly close to the midpoint of all of these uh, dwellings along, along the road. Uh, Montezuma's Castle and Montezuma's Well, misnamed, nothing to do with Montezuma, um, just later people coming in and saying, oh. But the ball court's interesting because you said it's a melting pot, so ball courts, aren't they associated with the uh, Mesoamerica and the Mayan uh, extensive ball courts? Well, there's, there's a great deal, a great many ball courts in Arizona. Um, and yes, the, the source, the origination probably is the Mesoamerican ball games uh, with the Mayan and others. Those were a little more violent in, the, in their nature. Uh, <laughs> by the time they got to the Hohokam uh, and the Hohokam brought ball courts all the way up to Flagstaff, uh, Chino Valley and, and around, uh, they were more like a trade fair. Uh, there would be games, uh, but it was more of a trading thing, a exchange of goods. Uh, for agricultural purposes and other, but there were in fact games played there. Uh, the, the ball court at the base of Sacred Mountain, uh, they did find early on uh, stone balls that might have been used as part of the games. Oh. Uh, there were tobacco plants uh, around the ball court. So uh, they were they were smoking something too <laughs> at the time. So, uh, uh, so I was wondering, what in a flat field is going to tell you it was once a ball court? That that's interesting. Well, there there it's actually is more of a scooped out area, and so it would uh, they scoop out the center uh, and and create kind of a, a bluff See? on the uh, sides, uh, kind of egg shaped, if you will. And there was always an entrance at, at either end. Um, Dr. Wilcox from Museum of Northern Arizona studied them extensively. Uh, and and one one suspicion he had was that they were astronomically aligned with the entrances, uh, but he only found that to be true for um, uh, a very small portion of, of the 32 or so in Arizona. Um, and the question there that popped up: Is it similar to the ones in Mexico? Yes, it's, they're very similar in structure to the uh, the oval, uh, well, egg kind of egg oval shaped. Uh, ball courts. They're just not very deep. And in some cases over the time, like this one at Sacred Mountain, uh, because they've dug it out, it obviously caused water to, to seep, seep that, that area. It's a lower area there. And um, uh, so. Uh, they had symbolic right. purposes to these ball courts. I mean, they, they were kind of like the cosmic order on display, play and display of it. So, I mean, everything they did had had significance cosmologically and symbolically. So an egg shape is very interesting for it. Yeah, and someone pointed out in a, in a question here that some of the, a lot of the Mexican ones are eye shaped and the ones in Arizona are a kind of combination. I call them egg shaped, they could be eye shaped, uh, but there's, there's a variety of shapes and I'm not the expert at it, Dr. Wilcox is, he's written several books on it. And so uh, I've only touched on the ball courts as they relate to potential astronomical connections. And uh, so far, the six that are in the Verde Valley, we have not found any astronomical connection to the ball courts as far as alignments are concerned. Mm -hmm. What do you want us to know before you start your slideshow to help put it into context? Well, it, you, of course, you asked me to talk about the the, the Vibar V Ranch, which which we will we'll get to the, at the end there. Uh, and but what I what I have here is pretty much the, the program I do for Arizona uh, Humanities and other programs. Uh, so I show you an, a number of other sites just to make the point that uh, if if we were to say the VBRV is it, it's the only one, uh, it, it lends itself to criticism when you say it's it. Well, how do you know it's just that's all they did. And so the fact that we have at least a dozen or more um, is it shows that, that, that it was a practice, that they were uh, well astute <laughs> within the uh, astronomical practices, and it was not just a fluke that they did the VBRV. And they were part of peoples all over the world watching the stars, watching the sun and the moon and this grand clock of the universe. So. Yeah. And so some of these I'll be going through fairly quickly um, since we don't have an awful lot of time, but I am covering basically central Arizona. I basically cover... Um, uh, Let's go, let's move. 
Okay. And I don't, I don't know if we really need to, this explanation is for the general public about archaeoastronomy, sometimes called cultural astronomy, uh, astroarchaeology, study of prehistoric cultures, as they use the sky for calendar, agriculture, ritual, ceremony, mythology, celestial event prediction. So, and it does draw on a lot of dis different disciplines. Uh, there's one calendar that I'll show uh, in a little bit that actually tracks the uh, hibernation period of the uh, horned lizard, and I'll explain why. Uh, so, again, as many of you already know, um, the main uh, methods of sky watching in the southwest is either sighting, watching the horizon, where the sun rises as it goes from the south uh, to the north, and also imaging, which is the more interesting one, with uses rock art uh, together with, with shadows. And this is here, my, my central area of study is the central uh, Arizona area of Verde Valley, although I was asked to go to the town of Springerville uh, a few years ago and, and study the uh, natural, natural historical site there uh, that was uh, alleged to be a calendar site. And um, I ended up finding it was a lot more complex than that, uh, working with uh, desert archaeology out of Tucson. Um, so but we're not going to cover that today, just don't have the time. <laughs> um, so sun watchers briefly, um, as, I'm, as many of you know, you know, he would be in a central spot, always sit at the same location, either top of a Pueblo or at a particular uh, location in the field and track the summer solstice equinox, winter solstice as it rose. Uh, here in the Verde Valley, uh, equinox at sea level is 90 degrees up here. It's usually 95, 96 degrees that, that the equinox will rise. And so one of the more challenging things to find is can you prove that you found a spot where a sun watcher watched uh, and observed? And I've uh, been lucky to find several of those. One is at the Honaki site. Uh, and as you can see where the arrow is pointing, um, Honaki is a very, very large dwelling in, in the Sedona Verde Valley area and it faces uh, southwest. And so it does not see the uh, sunrise. And so the theory when we were studying that site is uh, if there was a sun watcher here, which there must've been because it's surrounded by huge agricultural fields, uh, it would have to be at a place where the, 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 the uh, sunrise uh, could be observed. So we followed the butte around until we got to that particular uh, stone that you see there where the uh, marker is. And uh, it's a little close up view of it. And we get to the top uh, of that. There's this smoothed out area, uh, and you can see it's pointing to the uh, uh, to the southeast. And um, and there's actually a petroglyph that you can see there. And we'll highlight it here. And uh, in a particular Sun Watcher uh, autobiography or biography, um, I found this quote talking about his father, uh, who was a Sun Watcher, and said he would observe the horizon from a natural bowl in the rock a kind of smoothed out pothole and he would record his readings inside that bowl. Um, so what's interesting is you've got this petroglyph of a sun it marks where he's going to sit and the smooth that area is probably from his behind going back and forth over the years. Uh, what's also interesting is on the rock when you sit on that spot uh, as your legs go over the edge of the rock there are smoothed out two smoothed out egg-shaped areas where his calves would have hit. So um, this was That's pretty clearly. It's it's when I told the uh, the archaeologist was not aware of this site, and we went out there, and uh, he 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 agreed that this had to be a sun watcher seat. There's no ex other explanation for it. Um, this image, uh, actually, the the uh, this yellow line here actually. It's very hard to see, but it actually is a straight line across here. And that's actually the symbol of the, of the Hopi Sun Forehead Clan. And when I showed this to uh, a couple of the Hopi up there, they said they had that clan had no idea that they had been down here and that they wanted me to take them to the site. So I'm, I'm just waiting for a, a call back on that. So Sun Watcher is a designated role that uh, it's a title. There are sun watchers that are assigned, especially you said with agricultural fields, because they need to know when to plant, when to harvest, when to do this and that, right? Right, quite, quite often uh, certain clans, in, in, for the Hopi, uh, the predominant sun watching clan is the Potki or water clan. And they'd often be called on to, uh, to create calendars. And several of the calendar sites that I have has the symbol of the Potki clan, the horned lizard uh, there, almost like, you know, they put their little stamp that, you know, my clan, did this and at Vibar V there are two horned lizards on the site which is a little unusual and again we, we kind of think that's because it was such an important site they might have had two sun watchers uh, assigned to it this is another sun watcher site um, 
at Palaki. Palaki is another heritage site on the Forest Service, and I was a docent there as well. Um, so between VBARV and Palaki, these are the two things that kind of got me going on this. Um, at the back of this one little alcove, they call it the grotto, uh, there's this image. And you can see there's a big, large ball. And then you see a, a series of, of uh, four little peaks here. And then the fifth one is filled in white, a rectangular one, and then it opens up again. But what caught my attention were these black triangles down here. Hmm. So you see right here between the, the third and the fourth, there's two black triangles. And then right over the first one, here's another black triangle. And it was kind of weird, you know, like, why would they do that? It had to be marking something. And so as you, when you turn around and, and look in the opposite direction, it kind of looks exactly like this. So here's one red thing. Here's a second one. Here's the third one. Here's the fourth one. And then you got a white one. It's filled in white here. You see this guy's filled in white. That's for the sun catching. And then you, and then you have a rectangular white a bluff here so this drawing looked an awful like the opposite horizon and so uh, again going out there at sunrise for for a year um what we discovered was that where the one black triangle is is uh winter solstice sunrise where the two triangles are is spring and fall equinox to the left of the uh rectangular white bluff in line with the big sun image is where summer solstice sunrise is so so in effect this is kind of a reminder or maybe they would pass on the knowledge as to where is the sun going to rise for winter equinoxes and summer and they and used so arrows those black triangles arrow pointers just as we would that is brilliant apparently yeah. good decoding so, uh, that is so again this is kind of you know hard to hard to, actually when, the, when you go there some of the docents that it, that uh uh, they'll have an, a picture of this and they'll, they'll tell the people about it when they go to the grotto area. So those are just a couple of the shrines. Um, there's a couple more that we found and um, it's not as dramatic looking as, as, as these two, but um, when we, when we were, would record the declination of the sunrises of sun, the solstices and equinox, uh, we would then hike to the top of the ridge, the Mogollon Rim up there, and we actually found shrines, sun shrines, piles of stone, um, exactly in the declination line from uh, what, that we took from the from the observation point. So we're up to about four sun watcher sites, either because of stuff like this or because of the validation with uh, accompanying shrines. Wow. Uh, so then we get into imaging. There's several I'll show, and then we'll get into VBARV. Uh, also at Palaki, but at a farther down. Uh, this is an area of Palaki that is generally closed to the public, uh, unless there are enough volunteers to walk you back there. And the reason is that uh, you walk, uh, not, not it's not very far, it's a new, fairly easy hike, but when they used to let people just roam, uh, people were writing on the walls between the two sites. And to stop that, they don't allow people back there unless they're escorted back there. So uh, when, when groups call, archaeology groups or whatever call, they say, I want to go back there, I can get permits and we, we go back there. So this is a this big mound is a, an agave roasting pit. Uh, it's a huge agave roasting pit uh, because it was uh, created first by the Sanawa when they dug through it. Uh, they found a very small one at the bottom. Uh, that was a Sanawa uh, agave roasting pit. But when the Yavapai came, the Yavapai made larger and larger ones. And so there are huge roasting pits like this uh, scattered throughout the Red Rocks. Um, and this is uh, the, the result of the uh, Yavapai. Uh, You're saying they're roasting agave? They're roasting agave, yeah. That was uh, To make the them things. edible, okay. Oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's kind of like uh, a <laughs> type of artichoke almost, you might not say. But, um, so th again, this this there's a very unusual image here. There's this image. Um, you might see these black lines here and there. Um, the black uh, when, when the Yavapai arrived and they saw these images, if they believed that the images were powerful, and they wanted to take the image among themselves, or they want to recreate the energy of it, they would trace it. And all they had was the charcoal, and so they would trace the, the images and uh, to try to take it upon themselves or take, take over the image. If you go into the Yavapai uh, cultural director's office in Cam Verde, she has this image made into a uh, stained glass window and then she has it on her, on her wall. So we even so what I learned, in modern times. Yeah. What, so that shows you the power of symbols. And by the way, if it's a huge roasting pit, that meant a lot of people coming in a ceremonial fashion to celebrate. It was like an event site. Is that the implication? 
It, it's it's possible, you know, the the uh, the snobble would would roast maybe three or four, but when the Yavapai were doing it, they uh, they did up to twenty uh, agaves uh, in one pit. So um, uh, so yeah. It, and the it, Yavapai were a tribe that came in. Yeah, the the, uh, yeah, the Yavapai will occasionally uh, uh, the Forest Service will ask them to recreate a, a roasting pit. Uh, we've done that in, in uh, for part of V Bar V days uh, in March. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, they do that every kind, every other year. So uh, I haven't done it for a while, obviously because of COVID. COVID. So one thing I've learned in doing these, these watching these sites is to pay attention to everything. And so one thing that was unusual is when you look at these four quadrants, this one's got a little white line in here, kind of off-centered. Here's one again, off-centered. This one is almost a little off-centered, but there's nothing here. So if it were another one here, you would just say, well, that's just part of the symmetry of the image, but it's not. So I usually pay extra attention when I see these little oddities like that. Um, and this kind of shows you what, you know, highlights it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, watching it for a whole year, this is what happens at Equinox. <laughs> see, there's the two images, okay? Wow. So it's like when a, when a shadow is moving, and this is, you'll see another one coming up. When a shadow is moving across an image, how do you know exactly when it's the center? When is the right day to take it? as opposed to, you know, a day closer, a day later. Um, and so what I'm finding is that uh, uh, several of these calendars have created what I call register marks to guarantee that they're reading it on the correct day. So these two are register marks that, uh, which is, which is, when is it dead center? When is the day uh, recorded for the equinox? And so sure enough, on the 21st of the month, you get this equinox effect perfectly diagonally uh, uh, across it in line with those two register marks. So then you watch it every month for a whole year at, at sunrise. And, and to my great disappointment, there was nothing going on with this third one over here and actually nothing else with the site. It's either uh, all in the sun or all in the shade for a lot of the year. And then I realized that sometimes uh, at certain sites, uh, the Hopi uh, will tell you that they watched sunrise from the summer solstice uh, up to the winter solstice. And then they'd watch sunsets from the winter solstice to the next summer solstice. So I thought, well, okay, I'll start coming out here at night. So I came out here at sunset and sure enough, uh, eventually what I saw was this, <laughs> this, you know, and you look at, there's the two register marks perfectly in line uh, at a sunset time. And if this occurs on February 21st, never be on uh, six months later, October 21st. And so you might say, well, what are the, what's the importance of these two dates? Why would they record that diagonal on the equinox? Well, Yavapai elders tell us that's when they start to clear out last year's agave roasting pit. They get new rocks because when they put the fires in there, the, a lot of the rocks that line the thing will crack. Uh, they need to start collecting uh, firewood uh, repair, dig it out, repair the stones, get the firewood started. And usually equinox is when they do that. Is that why they did that? We'll never know for sure, but it's, it's interesting. February 21st, third week of February, that's basically when the Hopi do the bean dance and they start to plant the beans uh, inside the, the kivas to take them out. So is that what they were doing here? Again, we'll, we'll never know. But this whole calendar with the three, what makes us convinced that this was obviously intentional is you've got those three little register marks and one is to register the equinox and this particular one at sunset is to record uh, 30 days before uh, the equinox or 30 days after the, the, the uh, Also significant equinox. times. You are you're rewriting the manuals. Yeah. You're putting so, the missing manual pages to really understand well, things. <laughs> My gosh. Um, the other one is Rurik Canyon. Now, this this is a uh, if you if you're familiar with the area at all, V Bar V is way the heck down here. It's when it's Red Tank Draw, and Red Tank Draw eventually gets into the Mogollon Rim and becomes Rurik Canyon. And um, there's where I'm standing is on a cliff. It's only about four feet wide, a uh, little ledge. Uh, just you you drop you basically sit on on your butt and drop down onto this lower level about six feet. And it's only about four feet wide. So if you <laughs> lean over forward, you're going to go down 800 feet. So, but uh, again, the Forest Service archaeologist sent me here. He says because there's a jeep company that is taking people there that claim that it's the summer solstice marker, and he wanted me to go out and, and verify it. And uh, eventually, the jeep company stopped taking people because 
they had to sign like a 20 page waiver that if I fall off the cliff, I won't sue you kind of thing. And so they stopped doing that. Um, but I, I, uh, I, I continued to, to watch it. So at the, at the end of this long, there's a lot of rock art along the way. And when you get to the end of the path, there's this humongous boulder um, with this very, very large um, uh, spiral and other, other images in here. Um, interestingly, uh, and you'll 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 find this of interest. Uh, I, I like always. I go there every month for a year, and ninety nine point nine percent of the time, there's nobody there. I'm all by myself doing this. And uh, this one time, as I'm walking along the path towards it, I meet a woman coming in the opposite direction, and uh, which I, she startled me. I startled her, and uh, you know, I explained what I was doing there, and, and she said um, that. She, the Hopi friends had told her this was a sacred site and she had, I can't remember now if it was cancer or she had some disease that the doctor said, there's nothing more I can do for you. And they said, go here and meditate and, and pray here. And, uh, and she did. And uh, she said about a year later, she went back to the doctor and the, her illness was gone. There was oh. nothing left. Mm -hmm. And so she continued to come here kind of as a Thanksgiving kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I saw, so that's, that's kind of a, I, I bump into this that kind of story in Sedona a lot, um, and my reaction generally is I don't experience it, so I can't confirm it, but I certainly am not going to deny it. So, uh, but I just thought that was interesting that that uh, I bumped into her uh, there. So, uh, the site it turns out is a summer solstice, but it's a lot more than that. And so here we are at Equinox, and remember I mentioned the register marks at the last place. Here, this little teeny little line here. Mm -hmm. That's a register mark. And then here's another tiny circle that is going through the center of the circle. And so what you get is, again, this is a, a jaggedy line, but the line comes along here and it's perfectly in line with this little register mark. And then it kind of makes a jump up here, comes back and it goes through the center of this little tiny guy here. So mm -hmm. it's like a double guarantee that they re record the correct date. So um, I'm, you know, again, when I show this to the archaeologists or Dr. Wilcox, they all go, oh my gosh, register marks, you know, you got to publish that. So someday I'll publish that. So anyhow, so that's, this is the equinox there. Um, what I like is that they're following the natural contours of the rock and they're just tweaking it. They're really working with what nature is already providing them. And right. And I, I haven't found any evidence that up above they did anything to chisel the, anything. They just saw the shadow and then created the images to take advantage of the, the initial shadow. So here's summer solstice. And you look at the line going across the center and you say, well, that's a jaggedy line. How do we know that's really the center? Well, again, you follow it. And what you see here is it comes along here and then it dips into the center of this spiral and then continues out. So here, I'll show you. There it is. See how the shadow dips right into the dead center of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you, you can't really deny that this is going right into the center of that. So again, how do you know this is exactly the center because it's a wobbly little line? Well, here's your little register mark down here for summer solstice. Oh, amazing, isn't it? Uh, I, winter solstice, a lot of people look at this and they say, well, I don't see anything. Well, I mean, really, because that sun up here and you got sun down here, it's dark in the center, except you got a dagger coming out of the dead center of light. Mm -hmm. And then at the bottom, here you got the line coming here. And what happens? It goes right up to the center of this guy again and comes back out again. Uh, hmm. Do that. Yeah. So, you know, this, the, this dagger of light coming out of the center of nothing uh, to me is pretty significant. And then there's your register mark down at the bottom again. The dagger in the center of the concentric circles, is that chipped? Is that worn? Is that... What, what causes that abradement in the middle of it? You know, I, I have laid on the rock looking up, <laughs> trying to figure it out. And, and it's it's a very jaggedy kind of uh, overhang. And, and I have not yet figured out how they did that or what, what is the actual cause of it. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just, that's what happens. You know, and, I, and, I, and I'm left with just explaining just what happened. So, um, but it's it's and actually it does other things. Um, I, again, we don't have the time. This calendar actually measures cross quarters. Uh, there are there are lines that align and tell you when the cross quarters are, which is the period between an equinox and a solstice. That's the cross quarter time. So this actually records cross quarter times. Uh, different uh, 
uh, a person has recorded that and he's, he's published that. There's another really odd little thing over here. You see to the left, you see this little crescent line and then there's a, a deer-like animal here. Uh, again, at a certain time, there's another shaft of light that comes and it starts out very narrow and then it gets exactly the width of that spiral. And when it gets that, it gets wider and it perfectly frames the width of the animal. And it does this in April. So I went to the Forest Service biologist and I showed her this and she goes, well, you know, that time is about the time that the elk start to migrate. <laughs> so were they actually tracking the migration time of the uh, elk weren't there at the time, but there was an animal elk like uh, the uh, deer like elk like thing that was there, she said. And uh, that's about the, the migration time. So who knows? That would be um, useful knowledge, wouldn't it? Yeah. It would. It would be. Uh, this one, we, we kind of hide this site. Uh, we call it Thompson Terrace because the, one of the old pioneers, uh, Thompson, wrote his name on the wall. Uh, we really don't go here because it's still a sacred site to the Hopi. It's still a sacred site to the Avapai. Uh, a lot of rock art in here. And uh, But someone wrote an article about this image in the shadow over here uh, in California, in the uh, California Rock Art Association, that she claimed this was a summer solstice marker. Uh, winter solstice marker um, and then when you read the article she wasn't really there on winter solstice she was there on christmas she was visiting friends and she saw the shadow on this so the archaeologist got pretty irritated <laughs> but um, he sent me out to check it out so what draw my attention is not the only image you'll see in a second but this odd structure over here this big slab clearly came from up above okay and and, just it, and it just broke off and came fell down mm. but it's not down uh, and this is the image behind it. It's, it's a big circle, two round eyes, a rectangular mouth, hairs or feathers along here, and a big horn. Trying to figure out what this is, you can't really, you can't, uh, it's hard to just say, well, this is a calendar, but why, why is it, why is that involved with it? What is it? And so the closest I could come up with was that it looks a lot like the great water serpent of the Hopi. And this is a drawing from Alexander Stephan's Hopi Journal. And he recorded uh, them uh, performing the Great Water Serpent Ceremony uh, four times while he was living there in the 1890s. Uh, and so my first thought was, well, this might be the Great Water Serpent. But getting back to the slab, here's the slab, but it's being held up by two rocks on this end, which is, you know, weird. Now, were these just happen to be there? I, I kind of doubt it because when you, here's the rock close up of it. But when you look at this rock in the back, that's this thing here. And this has actually got a notch, a work of notch at the end here. Yeah. And so what they did is they lifted this up, shoved this under it because this is air above it all, all around here. It's just open air. Wow. So the only thing holding this in place is it's, it's this pressure between the edge of here. So mm -hmm. they lifted it up, shoved this in here, and then lifted the other end with two rocks to create this particular angle. Now, that's a lot in engineering. That is. When, when you talk about the level of astronomical knowledge, uh, in, in this one article that came out and recorded seven different levels of astronomical sophistication, and, and the seventh is the creation of a device to track time. And so the Sanawa, we believe, between this and BBRV, we're, we're at the highest level of, of astronomical sophistication. So they did all this effort for what? And so I went out there every month on the 21st uh, for a year, and it didn't seem to do anything. So I went out there for a whole year at sunset, didn't really do anything. It's a beautiful hike, <laughs> but still didn't do anything. Um, and then I went back and reread Alexander Stephan's Hopi Journal, and he said that when he, the four years that he was there, uh, the, the ceremony was performed on February 13th. Uh, well, okay, I'll go out there on February 13th. So I got there on February 13th, and this is what happens touches it touches the edge of it and and all of this is the result of that construction that's up above it and so why would they do that well february 13th they t it touches it that's the day it tells them to do the great water serpent ceremonies <laughs> and they could watch this as this gets closer and closer they could get ready so they call it an anticipatory effect this this thing gets closer and closer so they know hey we're getting close to the time to do it get your regalia etc together and then when it touches it that's the day to do the ceremony 
Now, what's so exactly. special about the great water serpent? He created, he brought water uh, to the world, but he also brought light. And so what we find is this blackness is not natural. That's uh, soot. So they blackened it. And then they created this white image as though the white image is coming out of the darkness. So he, the great water serpent created light, and he also because he's the greater water. So what's more important than light and water? So they would do a ceremony once a year for the great water serpent. So when I figured this out, I go running into the archaeologist's office, Peter Phillips' office, and I said, hey, I think I finally figured the darn thing out. I think it's the great water serpent ceremony marker. And he looks at me and he says, yeah, I know. I said, what do you mean you know? I've been going on here for two years. And he goes, well, you're the researcher. He says, but the Hopi have always regarded that as a great water serpent image. So <laughs> whatever. What validation for your detective work, for your methodology. Yeah, well, and he's done this to me a lot. <laughs> Where he's, he's got suspicions. He, I, I, I believe he's a closet archaeoastronomer. <laughs> he doesn't want to get out there and he doesn't have the time, but he, he believes it and he sends me out to these places. So this, I find this fascinating. I talk about it because here they went through a big elaborate creation of a sun uh, marker uh, just to record one day of the entire year to show you how, how sophisticated they were. So anyhow, believe and it or not, is, uh, here's Red Tank Draw. This is at the far end of Aurora Canyon. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Uh, this, so this, when you're at Aurora Canyon, you go all the way to the end. This is, as you're going to be Barbie, you cross over Red Tank Draw. And there are actually 16 petroglyph panels in red tank draw, eight on the east side, eight on the west side, two groups of four, which is not an insignificant number. Uh, but here you have a horned lizard. Mm -hmm. You have a horned lizard. You have outline cross, could be Venus, morning star, evening star, uh, 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 we call circle dot, sometimes used in calendar making. And then you've got kind of a, a spiral, circle dot, spiral, spiral, spiral. And again, this was kind of an interesting spot um, and when you get to winter solstice, you can see the sun just touches the beginning of the first thing here, just on, just grazes it on, on winter solstice. And then as you follow it throughout the month, it doesn't, it kind of like moves across, but then on the equinox, it's this perfect alignment of these two. And then it doesn't do anything else. The rest of the year, it's in full sun or full shadow. And so we're trying to figure what the heck is this all about? Why is it recording from winter solstice to, to the, uh, spring equinox. Well, then we look back at these horned lizards, which are the symbol of the Potki or water clan, and that's their totem. And and working with the naturalist in the area, he says, well, you know, the, the, the horned lizard goes into hibernation around winter solstice, and it comes out around the, the, the spring equinox. So perhaps that particular clan was tracking the hibernation of their totem image. Hmm. Uh, so we'll never know for sure, but uh, there are other things down here that's going on that kind of convinces us of that. But again, we don't have the time. So it's just, just uh, you know, show you I that. Think, could, I think uh, the genius is to recognize that they're looking at the natural lines, which are often jagged, whereas we think in straight lines. So yeah. to recognize their vernacular and their language with the lines naturally cast is, I think, a big breakthrough. Uh, and then before I get to be the last one here, Lincoln Canyon, uh, Pedestal Rock. Uh, we were surveying down here. This is a, a Honaki is off to the uh, east of here. And to the west is uh, Lincoln Canyon. And we were asked to survey after the Forest Service. And this canyon down here has got a stream running through it, Dry Creek now, but uh, it's totally covered in agricultural fields. So we recorded all of those. There's a couple little field houses down there too. And then we were kind of going up the, up the hills and we saw this really bizarre boulder and then went back down to look at it. And, and here's this rock. Uh, and it's hard to tell here, but it's a slightly different color of red sandstone than the surrounding area here. So it had been moved here. And you can see it's kind of worked to be in a rectangle. We think to take that, but they saw it and it took advantage of this natural crack in here. Here's the stream bed you can see down below. And it's placed right at the, at the edge. And you can't stand on the other side. It's just straight down on the other side. So this was positioned. Well, I never go anywhere without my, my compass. So I throw my compass on here to see different angles of what might be happening. And it looked like that crack was in line with the equinox sunrise. And so um, this is one of those places where you have to start hiking in the dark to get here by sunrise. So I conned another couple guys and we went out there with flashlights and we started hiking in the dark um, to get here at sunrise. And we got there for sunrise. Here's the sunrise. 
and it's a perfect align with the diagonal of the rock. Mm. So um, it's not a perfect align with the crack, but the crack, now who knows if that had any symbolism to it or did it crack after they rounded it? Because you can see the edges are worked. You know, these are smoothed edges. So this rock was placed there, we believe, to mark the equinox. Well, you say, well, that's cool, but that's it. And so the guy I was with, he said, well, you know, if you go up above, look up above, there's this wall of rock up here. And so we went up there to look at it. And, and there's nothing anywhere but this one wall. This is a sheer cliff down. So it's not going to keep people from coming up <laughs> because it's a sheer cliff. So they built this wall. It's about 35 feet long. And as you can see, it's perfectly straight line here. And unfortunately, there was another small section of wall here and it's fallen in, but you'll see it from the other picture. So they created this wall with a doorway at the edge of a cliff. And when you look at it, and I put my compass on the wall, summer solstice, you can see it's coming right in. Here's it's lighting up this plant. Here's the other doorway over here, it would have been here before it fell down. So you've got the summer solstice sunrise coming right through this doorway. And so what is that all about? Again, talk to the Hopi that when the sun is in the summer solstice and it stays there for visually like three days, it's the sun is resting in its summer home. When it gets to the winter solstice, it stays there visually for about three days. The sun is resting in its winter home. So were they creating with this wall a symbolic summer home for the sun to rest? So we've got this. And then we've got the, the rock down below. Whoops, getting ahead of myself here. Um, ah. um, when you look at the opposite wall, so we're at this wall, I'm looking across Lincoln Canyon here, and yeah. this is along Lloyd Butte, uh, this is Lloyd Butte, Honaki is over here. Here's a, 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 a hundred feet long wall that doesn't do a darn thing to protect anything, but there's an opening in it. And so, this is a work in progress. I'm thinking that this is again a summer, a winter solstice, uh, uh, winter home. That the sun, when it sets in the west, it's going to come right through the doorway there. And this is the, the, the sun's winter home. Whereas on the other side of the canyon is the summer's sunrise, um, summer home. Uh, so that's this is one of those places where you have to hike. And then you have to spend the night because there's no way to get up this cliff, you know, in, in the morning before the sun uh, uh, set. Well, you can get there by sunset, but you can't get down because it gets pitch black within a couple minutes. You'll never get back to your car uh, without breaking your neck climbing down a hill here. So this is a camping area. I don't camp. So I'm trying to find some some a graduate student I might con to go up there and camp. <laughs> so, so to understand this site, we need to understand that they had a personal relationship with the elements, with the sun, and that ceremonially, ritually, they are creating uh, and acting out the mythology of the sun, that he rested in the winter, he rested in the summer for those three days. And so it was important to honor the sun in this way, to build it, to anchor his, the sun and its blessings to, uh, to the landscape. That's a good way to put it, yes. <laughs> now, now this this is uh, and I'll be a B -B, I think is next. Uh, but this is this is a, unusual and different. Uh, this is a geoglyph. Uh, it's the only geoglyph in the Sedona Verde Valley area. The closest next geoglyph is down in Blythe, Arizona. Um, and uh, geoglyph is basically uh, there's positive geoglyphs and negative geoglyphs. People are usually familiar with the geoglyphs in Peru. You know where you fly over to see these humongous images of of hummingbirds and other things those are negative uh geoglyphs where they they clear the soil to make a, an image material uh, way okay yeah and a positive is they create a, like this an alignment uh above to create an image and and this is actually a serpent it's 85 feet long and it kind of snaggles around here to heads up here you'll see in a second and interestingly there's two openings there's an opening here and then you can't see it here but there's an opening over here and the unusual feature is just off of here, there's a series of uprighted rocks that have been embedded into the soil, right? Right opposite the opening. And, and so uh, when you look at it from the front, here you're looking back at the serpent, the head is like a rattlesnake, the head is larger than the rest of the body. And there's this opening, and this may or may not be 
representing the, his tongue coming out. So you've got this big head here, tongue coming out, and then the serpent that goes back. And again, it was suggested to me by the archaeologists that this might be a calendar of some sort. So we get out there for summer solstice, and what we find is that the sun comes through the opening, and at the end of the snake here, makes two straight lines right to this boulder, lights it up like it's on fire. Uh -huh. And that's what happens at summer solstice. So it just goes through this through this opening. The, the uprighted rocks are right here, and the opening is here. So it just makes it through the opening there to go right there and lights up this boulder. And then at the end of the snake, another line and lights it up. So pretty hard to miss that that's summer solstice. At equinox, it's interesting because you've got the sun rises exactly behind the uprighted rocks and it produces a dagger shadow right through the opening. So the only time you get this dagger effect piercing the serpent is exactly on equinox. So winter is a little, was a little more difficult. It turns out it's a winter sunset and through the second opening, which is hard to see here, it comes by here and it lights up this boulder mm -hmm. at winter sunset. So uh, it, it's a very elaborately created geoglyph to record solstices and equinoxes. Uh, the site is, uh, according to our, our, bio, our, our archaeologist, Dr. Todd Boswick, um, he's been up here a lot studying it. Uh, he believes this was a very major religious center because just above this serpent, is a very, very large dance dancing circle, a whole series of uprighted rocks. And when you fly over it, you can see like depressions around the inner circle. There's also a blowhole and they created, uh, so you get this cool air coming out from a cavern underneath it. Oh. And uh, the Bluebird clan for many years were going there and dropping prayer feathers into the blowhole. Uh, there's also a, a very odd, uh, there, well, there's a, there's a Kiva, circular Kiva there a uh, very large dwelling of about 60 rooms. Uh, so, and as a, uh, a community room, uh, there's a whole bunch of things going on here, but uh, the serpent is the more more dramatic, interesting thing. And it is, like I said, the only geoglyph in the whole Verde Valley. And the blood okay. would be like Mother Earth's breathing or something, right? It would be symbolic. It, exactly. Uh, the, the, even in the hottest day, you'll feel cool air coming out of there because there's somewhere underneath there and within this bluff, there's a cavern somewhere and it, it's uh, shooting cool air out of it. So finally at V bar V, that's, that's what you asked me for. And I, I forced oh, you to I listen to about all the rest of this. this is, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. Oh my gosh. Take your time. This is great. Yep. So, uh, but V bar V was a working cattle ranch uh, into the 1980s. Uh, the, it was first settled in 1906. Uh, and um, it had a variety of names, but V bar V is the cattle brand they used the V and a bar and a V like you see on the, this is on a fireplace on the ranch. Um, people ask, what did that stand for? Did it stand for Verde Valley? Well, the answer is no. Um, the people who bought the ranch wanted a brand. They wanted an easy brand. Uh, this brand was actually owned by a woman rancher in Flagstaff. <laughs> and they bought the rest of it. So, uh, and in 1994, uh, the University of Arizona approached the Forest Service and said, hey, we want to build an animal husbandry cattle uh, facility up here. We'd like to buy some land off the forest. And they said, well, we can't sell you land. But the V Bar V Ranch was privately owned. If you will buy that, then we'll trade you for whatever land you want. Because this not only, it's a riparian area that has 120 different species of nesting birds uh, along Beaver Creek. And also it, um, uh, it has the, the archaeological sites. So the University of Arizona bought the ranch uh, and then they swapped it for some land that they currently own. It's about three miles uh, south of V Bar V uh, on the same road. And they do cattle running up to the uh, Mogan Rim uh, throughout the year. And they show kids you know, how to raise cattle. So anyhow, so uh, it was extensively studied in 94, 95 and then opened to the public in 96. In 97, some idiots wrote their names, started scratching into the wall. And so they put fencing around it, and now it's only open uh, Friday through Mondays when there are docents there to watch and protect it. So, um, unfortunately, people are idiots. Idiots. Um, and so, so uh, I, so I'm, I'm, I was there as I said it early on as a docent. Here's the I don't show this in the in the picture, but this is the one you referred to before, where this slab 
uh, it has been worked at the edge here. It produces this shadow effect of the San Francisco peaks on the interior uh, of, the, uh, of the crevice here. Um, but that's a whole nother talk. Uh, so this one panel uh, has a number of engines you'll see in a second, but it's all produced by these two boulders uh, up at the top. And, and we had a big question you know, about their status and, and we, we'll sh I'll show you that, uh, how we answer that in a little bit. Um, as far as the images, there are seven concentric circles uh, across the panel and involved in the uh, calendar. Uh, there are two snakes, thick snake-like images that get involved. There's this very elaborate um, image up here. Um, we don't really have a name for it, kind of a stair-steppy thing. And then there's this very unusual image here. Looks like two, uh, in, in the original rock art recording, it was referred to as two sickle-like images with an asterisk in the arch. And all of these become involved in the, in the calendar. Mm -hmm. So when you come to the equinox, uh, the calendar here, uh, effect is here's the big concentric circle, here's the little one, and here's another one, perfectly framed mm -hmm. by the shadow line and you can see they're perfectly framed only on the equinox. Okay. Now another interesting feature interiorly, I, I show this in my book, this image here looks like a person on somebody's shoulders uh, is in several rock art sites referred to as a birthing scene and then this long wiggly line is often referred to as connectivity line and you can see it ends in a dot right at the line and it connects also to the sun image. So one suggestion, and it's perfectly framed by the shadow. So they created this image to be within the shadow line because the head is touching the edge of the line here and the line ends with the dot at the end of the line here. And so one suggestion is that this is mother earth giving birth, thanks to father, son, to the earth, now it's spring. Uh -huh. We'll never know for sure, but why did they create this wiggly image perfectly framed within that shadow line on the first day of spring? Something's going on there. We may never know for sure. Be nice to know their myths and the details. Exactly. So what I found is that there's, there's actually, it records, uh, there are corn plants along the thing here on April 21st, it, it touches a couple corn plants and that's usually the time of the early Hopi corn plant. For the time of the full corn crop. And here we have it, the, the shadow line here is perfectly up framed by the um, snake. And then you have a concentric circle on the one edge and a concentric circle here. And then this guy gets cut through the center and there's a dot at this snake and it ends at this bend. I'm positive. We're still kind of studying this particular guy. And then I'll come back to this, but you can see that the width of it is exactly from this bend to that bend. Okay. And that's significant. So it does early corn planting, late corn planting, and then you get to, uh, and there's the corn. Uh, when you get to that close up, there's the corn stalk right in the center of the oh, sun. Okay. So see here's, there's another corn plant over here and there's another one over here for the early and late planting as well. So when you get to uh, summer solstice, uh, the effect starts about 1250, lasts about six minutes. And hopefully I'll cross my fingers that this, uh, video will work. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. There we go. I can see the, the leaves are moving here. So here you can see the effect. It starts slowly, starts to build from the two, uh, the two shadow uh, lines. It's gone for a little, goes on for a couple minutes. It only lasts for about, when it gets, it gets to a certain point where it, like it's maximum and it, like it's stable for like a few seconds. And then it starts to recede. And so following the site here, we read everything when it's at its stable point before it starts to recede. And so, uh, so this is basically the summer solstice effect. Uh, and you see the shadow lines from the top to the bottom. Uh, it's like watching paint dry, but it's, 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 it's it builds as it goes. And, uh, when I'm, when I'm here and when the Forest Service had asked me to give lectures at the time of the summer solstice, um, I had one, uh, ins I insisted on the group. I said, when we get to the point that it's the maximum point, I expect the entire group to go, 
Ooh. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. I'll, it'll get to that point. So we're at the point, and then I got 125 people going, ooh. ooh. Yeah. So we have fun with it. We have fun with it. Um, so that's that's the uh, that's the effect, what you see when it, it's building. You see these two very distinct shadow lines coming down from the, the two rocks. Now, there could very well be other things being recorded along these lines. We just haven't been able to figure them out because there's a there's a, a lot of the, the whole panel is just covered in in rock art images. We know there's storytelling images on there. There are religious images because there's a whole bunch of images with cupules in them, and the cupules are in the heart, the head, the hands, or the feet, kind of sacra, chakra points. So there's a lot going on in this panel. We just haven't been able to interpret it all, including clans. So that's this is the effect that you you see. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and, and if you think about it, well, how does this work? Well, here we are, summer solstice, the sun is at the highest. Now it's going to start to recede and, and start to go south. And these two lines will actually start to, to, to go upward until it's a straight line here at winter. And then they both come back down again here to summer. And so it's like a pendulum, six months up, six months down. So it's, and then there are two uh, horned lizards up here. Again, this, the symbol of the Potkey clan. Uh, Sun Watcher symbols. So perhaps there were two that were, were watching this as well. We don't, we don't know. Question, the three rocks at the top, you call them gnomons. I'd never thought of a gnomon as being uh, vertical, mostly, uh, well, vertical, mostly from the ground up, but you're pointing out it's created by these three rocks. Were those natural or were those placed or were those tweaked? Uh, ah, you I'm coming to that. Uh -huh. uh, yes, we call them gnomons. Gnomons basically is, is it's a shadow producing something. It could be a stick. It could be a stone. It's something created to cr produce a shadow. So that's why we call them gnomons. Um, so it's actually this the lower one, uh, and then this upper one, and then this one is holding it, holding them in place. A wedge. So that was one of our big questions: is is this natural or uh, or what? So this is just a little closer up of the summer solstice image so you see this it's this shadow is, is uh kind of framed by these guys again now we're at the last two uh the width of this is exactly the last two there's a dot here uh so it's it's a dot and then these lines we saw before it was these these two lines now it's these two lines and then this was the key this was the kicker um these were as i said it's touched right at the back of this one and it was recorded initially as sickle-like images. Well, when you get up close, each of these two images have two little feet popping out at the bottom. Huh. And so what we finally figured out that these are actually two dancing figures bent over dancing at the sun, the, aster the uh, asterisk here. And that's at, at the time of the home dance of the Hopi. So this is the symbol of the summer solstice for the home dance. So that was pretty much the kicker is what this was. So you have a lot of confirmation because the current Hopi elders and their ceremonies that they still practice and the symbols associated with those practices are tied to what your solar calendar and set of symbols say. So you're finding right. some direct Trust confirmation correlation. and correlations. And, and we, we, we get Hopi come down quite a bit, you know, to, to look and study. Uh, the, the image I was showing you before, this the stair stepping guy, again, we, we follow this and watch this separately, but it's there's seven lines, two dots at the top. Here we are with the, at the April 21st. You can see the width starts at this dot and it's exactly three segments. And then the next 30 days later, it's down at these two segments. And then 30 days later, it's the last two segments, right to this dot. Wow. Well, it takes 90 days for the sun to move from this dot to that dot. And the gestation period of corn in the Verde Valley is 88 days. So what we think is that this was kind of like, you know, if you get uh, cloudy days and, and uh, you lose track of time and all of a sudden the sun pops up, you can watch this to tell you where you are in the 90 day planting cycle. So it not only tells you when to plant first crop, second crop, third crop, but as it returns, as it goes backwards, it's time to harvest the first crop, harvest the second crop, mm. and then the third crop. So, mm -hmm. uh, and then what's what's after this? Okay, you get to the here, summer solstice, four short lines, which is often hope you refer to as lightning, a tight spiral water, lightning and water after the summer solstice is monsoon monsoons are arriving so we think it's also 
a guide to tell them when are the monsoons arrive are going to arrive and if they don't get everything rooted by then they could just get washed away so this was kind of an extra little thing that we were watching along the way and it's i mean the fact that it's these perfect widths um it, it's not accidental so um, i think this was definitely a combination of uh of planting to get their act together if there were cloudy days, but also predicting when the monsoons will arrive. So you asked about the monsoon, uh, the, the rocks, when, were they normal or not? So we call this Nomen 1 because it produces shadow, Nomen 2, cliff, cliff face, cliff face, and then this is a wedge boulder. Now this is a different color because when we got the geologists up there, and you can see we, we got permit to uh, erect scaffolding. Uh, we did not touch the rock face at all. Um, up here, uh, we actually had two levels here. We were watching the, the, uh, the, the, the what you call it, the one that creates the, uh, uh, the San Francisco peaks in here, but also studying the rocks. So we had geologists up here, we had the archeologists up here. And um, this is this color is, is like this because uh, at some point when it dropped in place, the face, he saw a micro fracture and he said that the face of this fell off and is down below in the ground somewhere. It should be, uh, had this, uh, uh, lichen growing on it, but it's not because it, the face broke off and it fell down. So these two two gnomons. Now, what we found was that this gnomon, this is wedged in there like, the you know, nothing's going to drop it. Nothing's going to drop this guy. This guy was moved. Gnomon one was definitely moved because it should have been pointing a little bit more to this angle here, and they moved it to this <laughs> angle. And now this not stable. So instead, they put in cobbles and basalt wedges in here to hold it in place hmm. so it's a combination we know that they moved it because of the angle and we know that they knew it was unstable and they put these wedges of a cobble plus basalt wedges all along here and you can see it's wider narrower thin so they manufactured these wedges uh for the open width there and jammed them in there and when we were up there we had, we had the, the geologist that was there is also a, uh, he works for a mining company and uh, uh, he does OSHA inspections. And he says, if this were an OSHA site, I'd close it down. <laughs> but this rock is very unstable. It's only being held by these little rocks. It could come down at any time. And we said, yeah, but it's been up here for 800 years at least. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if this was an OSHA site, I'd check you down. So so uh, so we, we documented all of this, uh, that this was in fact, uh, moved yeah. and so uh, what we think is they dropped uh, ropes down and then lifted it up from up above and then shifted it over and then jammed the wedges in that's pretty sensitive and uh expert engineering on their part back then yeah. wasn't it yeah exactly so um uh, it, it was pretty pretty clever yeah. uh, winter is interesting yeah. uh, winter is uh, you've got the here's the panel with all the rock art on it and um and then there's this, this big natural pillar here. And um, we noticed that there was a, a line uh, on the ground. And um, when, we, when we looked up close to that opening here, um, down at the bottom here, it has stones. It, it was placed here in kind of like a stair step fashion. Hmm. It was not just random rubble. Okay, yeah, I think everybody can see that. These, this is, these are placed there to produce this bottom point. Now, why would they do that? Well, when you get to the winter solstice and the sun passes from east to west, it's pausing right at the very bottom of it. And what you get is a dagger on the ground. Oh, wow. So they put those slabs there to uh, create this dagger uh, on the ground at the time of the winter solstice. Um, one lesson I learned is when, I, when you get an effect, don't just say, oh, cool, and run away hang around because there might be multiple effects that um there might be another thing and it turned out that about an hour later the sun passed that pillar it hit a notch way up high and it threw this dagger right back to the center of this concentric circle so there's actually two winter solstice effects the dagger on the ground and then the dagger on the wall so that was pretty cool and it's it's kind of a cool thing in winter to watch it uh, because it starts over here as a little thing, and then it just keeps growing and get bigger, and then it hits the center of this this guy here. So, unfortunately, 
uh, when the archaeologist or the geologist said, hey, if this was an ocean site, I'd shut down, he wasn't far off because when Tropical Depression Rosa came through in October of 2018, with top winds of 35 miles an hour, came through uh, Arizona, California, Mexico, caused a lot of flooding. The next day, this boulder came down. It fell. So you, we cannot see the full effect. We can still see the effect from this boulder for different effects, but the two boulders, the, the stair-steppy guy, gone. So this boulder has, has now fallen uh, and you can't repeat it. So it's we're fortunate that we've recorded the whole thing. Oh, yeah. uh, we did actually take a, a movie uh, of the whole thing. It's about an hour long, but um, so we have all that recorded. Uh, people ask, well, gee whiz, can they put it back up there? Well, <laughs> it's very, very, uh, and it broke, basically it broke as it came down too. Um, so we can't get it up there. Uh, some said, well, why don't you recreate it and put it back up there? Well, you would have to consult with the Hopi. Mm. Right. Could you have maybe shorted up before it came down? Would that have been permitted? That No, no. Yeah. Yeah, you, 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 yeah. uh, the Hopi, our, the Hopi uh, cultural officer is on our um, <clears throat> advisory council for the archaeology center. And the one condition they said that you, we had to adopt the policy that we would never do anything to preserve anything uh -huh. to be on our council. So if a sandal is going to deteriorate, it's going to deteriorate. If rock art is going to fade away, it's going to fade away. If this falls down, it's going to fall down. Why does it do that? Because the creator says enough gotcha. and it just does its natural way. So for the, to for us, so the, but basically their answer is the creator said, you saw that you saw this, you understand it. Mm -hmm. The time is over right and, and, they he, the, and the creator caused this to fall that's that's their answer and and they would not permit you to bring it back up so, which is in total keeping with their whole philosophy so it right. makes sense in that context right yeah. so it's it's just luckily that we we were able to record that well you mentioned the the ground level that the one shaft hit the ground where there were rocks but you right. also write, and the docents mentioned, that there were petroglyphs b uh, below ground. What is the current ground surface? Yes. And so could you explain that? How much more is there beneath the ground? What have you seen of that? Right. And that made it even more difficult to work this site when it was even taller than it is today. Right. You can see, you can see it. You look at the bottom here. You can see this little rope. OK. This is an excavation pit. Um, we uh, in 20, uh, 2008, uh, the Forest Service decided they wanted to put a flat platform, observing platform here, uh, because it's very steep when it gets rainy or cold or whatever, it's slippery. So they wanted to put a platform in here. And in order to figure out what, whether they could do a platform or not, they decided to do a, an excavation to see if there was anything down there. And their, their assumption was, oh, there's nothing going to be down there. And so we did about 20 test pits. Um, the whole field was, was gridded in one meter by half meter strings. And we randomly uh, selected uh, and dug 21 pits. And every single pit had an artifact in it. Uh, it could have been pottery bits. It could have been uh, charcoal. But every one of them had something. And um, the interesting thing is, as you dug down, when you got to the, the natural, quote unquote, natural floor for thousands of years, it's uh, all the surface above it. When you get through the first half inch of surface right now, it's very hard. It's compact for people walking on it, rain falling on it. But once you get past that first crust, it's real soft and, and, and sandy. So it was very easy to, to, to excavate after that until you get to what the original ground level was. Makes sense. And then you come to a hard, compact, kind of grayish color. And so at the wall here, uh, this was my pit, actually. It was um, 35 inches down from the wall to the real ground. When you got to the outer fence of the perimeter, it was about six inches down. So mm -hmm. this whole slope of dust occurred after the Sanawa left around 1400. Uh, through wind, storms, fall from up above. And when we did the excavations, you don't touch the rocks that are sticking out from the line uh, and you record it. And uh, what we found was that 
there was, it, we thought at first it was floods from the creek washing it up above it, but then the, the rocks that were within it would have been kind of in line with the surface, uh, lying kind of flat. But what we found with the rocks protruding from the edges of the excavation, there were all different angles. So clearly above as opposed, as opposed to uh, just being settled from, from flooding. So, um, and when we, there were two uh, holes, this one and one farther down that we did actually go right up against the rock art face. And there was at least another foot of rock art below the current ground level that's there at the face. Um, and so um, this, this pit, as I said, was mine. And, uh, and actually, if I go back here, I, this picture, I'm sitting in that hole, <laughs> taking this picture right up against the wall when I took this picture. Wow. Um, but because the dagger is down here, again, the question is, well, I said to the archaeologist, can I dig out this? Because there might be a concentric circle uh, down here that this tip is hitting. And he goes, well, no, that's not part of our, our permit. And I said, well, you know, I've got a big ass. What if I set it here and it, everything collapses in? And he goes, don't do that. <laughs> so, uh, so, so there, there's something. We, so my suspicion is, is down on this rock, farther down, there is a concentric circle down here that this tip is, this point is right in the center of. And aren't you dying? My that? suspicion. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, yeah. Very cool. Anyhow, so that that's that's your that's answers your question, I think. So. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So you had shown my one book. This, uh, these are this is the book on the uh, the scaffolding. Uh, mm -hmm. When we did that study, and there's all kind of geological reports in there about and drawings from the, the back of it. Um, all these are on Amazon. Um, this Sinago Sun Watcher is a, the extensive study just on B Bar V, and Heart of the Sky covers all the the, the uh, ones that I showed you today, plus a few more, uh, including the Springerville site. So um, all of these, you know, uh, they're printed by the Archaeology Center. Uh, all the profits go directly to the Archaeology Center. I've never made a nickel on any of these uh and if i get a fee for my talks that goes right back to the center so um i consider myself privileged to be able to do this it's on public lands so um i shouldn't profit from it so um, it all goes right back into the archaeology center Fantastic. so that's my talk oh well, my gosh and and the, yeah. what a body of work what a detective story what brilliant um hey we, i would i would use that, that. thank you yeah. My wife says my wife said it's a good way for me to stay out of the bars. Basically. Right, <laughs> that would work. We want uh, to go to uh, questions and comments. Sure. Do you want to uh, end your screen share? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, let's go to Tony first because Tony Hall gave us at every for the last year of our zooms every equinox and solstice. Right. He gave us his reports of observing from his own uh, vista there in Placidas outside of Albuquerque and also encouraged us to create solstice and equinox markers in our own backyard. Right. And uh, so I want to go to to Tony first. OK, so that was. Hey, Tony, cool. you can. Uh, Whoa. <laughs> there you are. Hey, yeah. Yeah. You are. Hey, plenty of questions. Good to have you. Yeah. Well, to, to just just a few. Ken, uh, wonderful to uh, hear you again. See you again. Uh, it's been yeah. too long, uh, and you're you're doing amazing things. So I really appreciate it. Uh, one of the things I have um, kind of focused on, and, and I started this uh, back around 2010, 2011, was um, the question: Why would somebody mark the equinox? And how would somebody mark the equinox? And I saw you present a, a wonderful progression of dates. It seemed to be on a one month pitch around the 21st. I'm wondering if there's something else happening other than the significance of the sun crossing the equator and being at, at, at zero declination, if there's something else that happens in terms of planting, hunting, uh, game movement, ceremony at or around that date. So that might be something other than honoring the uh, the astronomical effect. You know, and, that, and that's a very good question because I, I get that a lot because there's so few equinox markers out there. And, and here we have three or four, five here. Um, and, and the only solid thing I come up with is the avapai telling me that that's when they would clear out the, uh, the roasting pits. Um, but whether there was some other ceremonial purpose or whatever, I've not been able to find it in any of the ethnographic records. So I, I just, I just, I can't answer that. I don't know. Okay. It's, yeah, I, th I think, I think it is interesting and in that maybe other things are happening at the equinox. Uh, the only, um, 
way I've been able to come up with for accurately knowing the equinox as a singularity is with a gnomon, and by that I mean the vertical pole gnomon, shadow, casting a shadow and marking with pebbles or something the position, very much like what Paul uh, and Laura instituted at Kayamange. Uh, is there any evidence of ancillary um, measurements on the site? So the date would have been important, and then they would look at the horizon marker. Yeah, uh, I, I haven't. Um, what the first thing that popped into mind when you're talking about that is when when we uh, went to the top of Sacred Mountain with the sixty Pueblo rooms there, uh, and we and again, what, how did they at V Bar V? How did they figure this out as far as the dates and to put the rocks there and when it was a shadow there, and and so the theory is well, there must have been a sun watcher watching the horizon sometime, and so he would like watch the summer solstice. And say okay, today's the summer solstice sunrise. I'm going to go over to the rock art panel, and when this when the sun shows up over there, then I'm going to mark my concentric circle because I know based on the horizon watching that today is the summer solstice mm -hmm. or the winter solstice. And so we went to Sacred Mountain and said, well, there must to prove that we have to see if there was a sun watcher seat at Sacred Mountain. So we went to the the top of the highest point and recorded the declination at, at the solstices and the equinox. And then we hiked to the top of that Mogollon Rim. And that's where, er, what was interesting is at all three uh, of them, uh, of three where, of the, where we recorded the declination, there was not this the one shrine like you see in, in Jesse Walter Fuchs books on, on where the Hopi shrines were. There was yeah. double, there were double rock cairns. So there were two cairns of stone. And when you stood between the two, you were right in line with the declination of, the, of that time and in line with Sacred Mountain where you were recording it. And, and so all three of them at summer, at um, equinox and at winter, there were double uh, cairns of stone to record that. So that, that really proved, uh, and in fact, the Hopi didn't want me to photograph the shrines. They were still considered sacred. So um, I have one in there, but just the one. I don't show the, the double as a double. Uh, and he said it was okay to do that. But that kind of proved that there was a sun watcher from that spot watching these events that who then said, okay, I got up early in the morning. I see that this is summer solstice. I'm all here by myself. I'm going to go down below. And when it hits the shadow, I'm going to make the image so I can get everybody else to come and see when the summer solstice is at midday. Yeah. So... And presumably they would do it in pigment first to get it all mapped out before they pecked it and made it permanent. Well, actually, actually, what's, it, what's really interesting is we think there's a, a mistake on the wall. What they did is they made a bunch of, uh, they just quickly made a bunch of circle dots. They just made little circles, okay? And, and said, okay, that's it. And then when I have time, I'll come back and clean it out. And just about like two days before one of the, uh, the, the equinox, there's this dot circles of dots that never got cleaned out. And so we're suspicious that they did that. And then he realized, wait, 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 wait we're too early. We got to wait. And then he came back two days later and then made the, made the clean one. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's very helpful. Ken. I appreciate that. And I'm, I'm absolutely stunned at the precision of your solstice uh, measurements. They're really tight notches. Yeah. Uh, very, very nice. Yeah. Especially with the, with the, with the register marks just kind of like blows everybody away when they, when they see the register marks. Uh, yeah, and, and, and when you're looking through the slots, I mean, that just just amazing. That yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. really nice. You're probably seeing the sun to a, a half a disc or a quarter disc resolution. Very very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. brilliant work. Cool. Yeah. Good to see you again. <laughs> yeah. Good to see you again. We we have to catch up. Uh, I'll, I'll shoot you my. I'll put my email address in in chat, and, and maybe we can yeah. catch up. So those of you that don't know, Tony is an astrophysicist. He's an uh, adjunct professor at the University of New Mexico. But more importantly, he's on the advisory committee of the Queer Monkey Institute. That's so. his best role right there. <laughs> We're really happy yeah, to have him be, be a and part of And he's done a lot of archaeoastronomy yeah. uh, in the area. Absolutely. A lot of Chaco, yeah. too. Yeah. Thank so you, I'm, Tony. I'm going to go to some questions yeah. here. And thank you, Ken. And, and thank, thank you, Paul and Laura. Uh, thank, thank you, Tony, Tony, for all your education you've given us, too, on all of this. Cameron has his hand up. Cameron, we'll go to you next. Um, I work on uh, the Southeast and I do archaeoastronomy for the Southeast. I'm a grad student at Mizzou. And uh, one of the things that you talked about that I thought was really interesting as far as my work, I'm working on a, a disc that is a um, roughly a, a foot long, a foot wide, about an inch thick. 
that looks pretty much like a calendar disc, like a Mesoamerican calendar disc. And we found this in the southeast around Mountville, Alabama. And there's archaeoastronomy uh, glyphs that are on this disc itself, right? And I've pretty much been able to uh, find a lot of the various different angles for the, what has been added and what their, their strong, what their significance would be. But I have one angle that's kind of like crazy, goes off into a different direction, all right, that doesn't seem to match the other several ones that I've found, all right? And one of the things you mentioned is that, and something I'm going to now look at, is that uh, sometimes these things don't act necessarily work, these angles you're seeing don't necessarily relate directly to an astronomical event. They may just relate to something that has like cleaning out the pits of the uh, agave pits or possibly some aspect of uh, their their uh, uh, their lifestyle or their, their ritual or whatever else. That's something I'm going to look into as well because it could be possible that's something that I haven't, I haven't looked at specifically yet. I, 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 to tell you the truth, I have uh, where I can put and pinpoint the major and minor uh, moon uh, uh, phases on the disc. But you have this one extra one that just goes off into a weird direction. And like, oh, I can't explain that one why it does it. It could be something just as simple as this is the time frame we decide to hunt. <laughs> so you really, yeah. it's, it's possible. You know what I mean? And I need to look at that a little more carefully. Yeah, the, the, tough, the toughest part is finding an eth ethnographic reason why they would have done something. Right. And, and sometimes you're just left with, well, this is what happens. And, it, and it's obviously been created to do this. I don't know why they did it. It's probably been lost over time. It's like, you know, you, you talk about Chimney Rock up in Colorado to, to record, like you say, the, the, the lunar standstill. There's nothing in, in the Pobolo ancestral ethnology that talks about that. And so you ask them, we, we don't know why they track that. You know, here, clearly that's an uh, ancestral Pueblo on site, but they've lost over time why they did that. So there's probably a lot, a lot of other things that they recorded. And the best, personally, I think that we can do is say, this is so obviously done and created. We just have lost the reason. It's probably not an astronomically significant date. It probably has to do with a ceremony or an activity, but we don't know what it is. It's been lost. The other problem, of course, is that my piece of work I work on is portable. It's not wow. something that stays in one spot, all right? This is something that can be picked up and moved, like a calendar disc. Yeah. So it has to be aligned perfectly to, like, north or whatever else. And going back to something that Tony was talking about is that in my research, it's been pretty obvious to me that having a, a working calendar is of utmost importance for any society you're talking about. It's one of the, if, if you want to plant and you want to do it consistently and you want to have agriculture where you're feeding your people, you have to have that working calendar, all right? right, right. So therefore, yeah. things like the equinoxes, the solstices, and any of these these dates that they can mark on the calendar and, and be able to work off of those, those points are incredibly important to be able to align that calendar. And something else I've noticed as well that like in the Mayan calendar, for example, um, and the Aztec both, they will have an addition of five extra days towards the end of it, all right? Which it appears to me to be the whole purpose of these five extra days is to realign that calendar if it needs to, to move things around if, if, if possible to make sure it aligns itself. Like so we have a lead here, with, right? So if you're dealing with a situation of a solstice, or an equinox or some of the nature, right? Where in my case, like a solstice, where you have three days where that sun is in a position, as you know full well, it's not gonna move, all right? Cause you see it over that peak over there, mm -hmm. that you know, if you wanna get it perfect, you, you're not gonna get it perfect, but you can look at how it progressed throughout the year and you can work out, well, I need to either add a day or subtract a day from what I'm dealing with to make sure this lines up correctly. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that's what I do. Yeah. And, and they, they can't use something like, you know, when the first, uh, you know, maple tree buds its leaves, it's time to do something. Well, that changes from season to season. So the only yeah. thing that's that's consistent is the sun. And, and also what you're talking about, you're talking about people that grew corn. Right. Right. right? And you have to have 123 frost free days for corn, obviously. Now, in the southwest, you're not too worried about that. But in the southeast, that's uh. a really different situation. All right. And you have to be able to know exactly you know, and I'm sure in the Southwest, you're dealing with the aspects of how dry those seasons become. 
for workable water. You have to be able to know exactly when to plant and had the it's, importance of that is paramount, I would say. My personal opinion on it. I'm not a southwestern person, all right? That's not my archaeology like you, but I mean, I would bet that would be even more important to you guys than even to yourself. One thing that we learned from the ethnographers working at the Kwimunge ancient village site right. is that they were putting down um, solar mulch. They were putting down stones that were brought up from riverbeds on their fields so that the sun would warm the stones, radiate at the shoulder seasons to extend their growing season. So that's interesting too, how they're they're using the landscape to waffle farming and everything else. Yeah. Right. I also wonder about uh, can the all the solar markers out there that has been um, dismantled by nature by erosion right. and that they're there but we don't recognize them because we we're not recognize. seeing their alignments mm -hmm. so there might have been uh, double the amount of markers out there that nature just disassembled over time so right, just like the the stone that had just fallen how many exactly. stones have fallen you know in the last 800 years for example or rock art has been faded or you know Unfortunately, we have examples of developers picking up boulders of rock art to make it pretty for their development and moving things. So it, who knows what we've lost over, over time. So I would um, bet that's a paper unto itself. I don't know if it's ever been written or not, but the aspect of, okay, we lost something off of the, the rock face. We lost something off whatever else. Time to create a new solstice marker. You know yeah. what I mean? And over time, they progress and keep making these as they fall. You know I mean? Because there's a very so, long period of time in which they were doing this. We can trace these back for millennia. As back as it goes, you know I, mean? I don't know if there's anyone ever done that paper or not, but I think it would be a really interesting concept to write on something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhat related to that is, is uh, you know, I, uh, it took me three years to record everything at the Springerville uh, Casa Mopias historical site. And um, uh, working with the desert archaeology down in Tucson. And, and what, what, what I eventually recorded was about 14 calendars at this one site covering about 300 years. Wow. And so the first, and when I, when I started to put the, the, the report together and then uh, and, and desert archaeology, archaeologists all confirmed it all. Um, they said, well, when you put this together for the public, don't put them all in there. They'll, they won't believe it. Right. That there's that many. <laughs> um, and, 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 and the reason, excuse me, the reason why is why did they have all these? If you think about it, you know, um, when you get a new pastor at your church, he's going to change stuff. If they got a new shaman, he, that shaman wants to show that he can talk to the sun God himself, you know, and father, son, and he created his own calendar thing. So we believe that the reason there were like 12 or 14 calendars over this 300 year period that it was occupied is Different shaman came along and said, "Way, well, I could do one better than that, or something." So, um, so it's not necessarily there was different reasons for doing it. It's just that you had a different person who is now in charge of this that decided to, to do his own. Um, just human nature. It's a human nature thing. So, and also um, to find some you long clan mark at Sorry. each um, at each solar calendar there. The, the different clan marks. But go ahead, Kim. Yeah. I said I, I expect to find some wrong ones too because if the stone shifts. Right. Uh, okay. alignments off. All right. So they're going to either extend that marker out or do something to change it to make it look better. You know what I mean? Would you admit to make it more accessible or make it work better? Or they're going to abandon it and make a new one, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Something anyway, it's really been great yeah. talking to you. And uh, I appreciate, you know, I'm glad you guys are doing that kind of work. I've never seen anything like that before. That's really cool. So yeah. thanks a lot. And thank you for your presentation. All right. Well, thank you, Ken. I know. We only have like five minutes left here. Was any final questions or summation you want to offer up? And I, oh, the cupules. I okay. wanted to talk about the cupules. So our understanding is that, and we've seen cupules on shrines with the with the grinding stone right next to it. And so what my understanding was, and I want you to add to this, was you grind it, and the the flower, the rock dust would be ceremonial. It would be part of the shrine that you could carry with you. It was now placed in your medicine bag or used in ritual or um, the archaeologist we talked to said even maybe placed in the in the food to bless it. There was some purpose with it. Mm -hmm. So the act of grinding was also part of the activation of the shrine and uh, it was um, um, just a, a part of it. You mentioned the cupules in some of the uh, petroglyphs. Could you speak more to that? And what your theories are around it. 
there are, there are, uh, there, there's 1,032 petroglyphs at Vibarvi. 69 have cupules and they're placed in the head, the heart, the hand or the feet. Mm. So these are all kind of power centers. Okay? And, um, and so we believe, and actually they were put there, it's believed at least 50 years after the images were actually created. So they weren't actually, they didn't create the image in order to put a cupule there that some later generation came along and, and came up with the cupule idea and, and put them in the images. Oh, um, and so we think they were religious. There are a couple rocks. Uh, well, in California, they call them rain rocks. If you wanted to produce rain, you would create a cupule uh, and, and do something with the dust as part of a ceremony in, in California, they call them rain rocks. Um, there's some rocks that are used for hunting magic for the same purpose. Uh, so you would, you would like the, 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 if you have an image of a deer and then you create a cupule in it and you capture that dust, you've captured in the dust, the spirit of the animal and you carry the, the, the dust into the forest with you to guarantee a successful hunt because the animals are going to come to you to try to reclaim the spirit. Okay. That's, that's one possibility. Um, Zuni have had this thing where they go to a, uh, if a woman wants to, uh, has difficulty conceiving or she wants to get a female child, uh, Sham takes her to a sacred rock, creates a, uh, cuts the dust and creates a drink for her with the dust uh, to, to do that. Uh, in medieval times, if you go to the, some of the really old cathedrals during the Black Death, you'll find cupules in the cornerstones of the cathedrals. Uh, and people were drinking the dust, thinking that the holiness of the cathedral would protect them from the black dust. So th there's cupules go back a long way. There, there, there was a conference down in, I forget now, Peru or Bolivia a couple of years ago, just on cupules, mm -hmm. that it was the oldest form of rock art in the world. It's, they're all over the world for different purposes. So, uh, yeah, different things. Sometimes the cupules, if they're on a flat surface, is nothing more than an area to grind paint or to grind grain. So you have to be careful that every cupule does not necessarily have a religious purpose. It could have utilitarian function as well, depending on, on where it is. So, yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. It shows you the power of symbol. So it's a way of activating that symbol and bringing it with you, right. similar to creating a shadow line to bring that sacred yeah. sign. Right. And let me, let, me leave, let me leave with one request. Uh, we have been trying to figure out why when you go from Mayan to Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, you always see the three concentric circles used as father summon images in making calendars. So our thought is that there were traveling astronomers that actually oh. carried this knowledge around. Uh, there was a burial in Flagstaff and he was clearly not a local, but he was buried with a, uh, a medallion on his chest of three concentric circles. There was another one in Tucson that was buried with three concentric circles. If you go to Chicago Field Museum and you see these a line of nine figurines, uh, they're all obviously made from a, uh, a cast, but they all have nine different uh, symbols on their chest, uh, medallions. And they all they represent what their function was. And when you get to the ninth one at the Mayan list, the Mayan symbol has got three concentric circle medallion on his chest. So we have this theory that that there were people that traveled, just like you trade in macaws or copper or whatever, that people were, were ex explaining how to make calendars and went around. So we keep looking for more evidence uh, of that, that that people have. And that camera's wave, waving and waving and waving. So uh, but <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're looking for more evidence of that. Maybe put it together. <laughs> Cameron, we have a story. So itinerant sun watchers, and this was their badge, this was their guild, and they went around and they helped establish the same vernacular for solar calendars in the wide we, trade. We have that suspicion, but you can't, yeah. you can't prove so that based exciting. on two guys, okay, <laughs> in Arizona. So we're look, we keep looking for more evidence. Yeah. That's yeah. exciting. We're Cameron, you have something to add to that. You're talking about the Pochenta, right? Or how you pronounce it right? Pochinta. Oh, Pocheca? Pocheca. Yeah. The, the travelers, the, the traders. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Pocheca, yeah. Now in the southeast, the very disc I'm working at, if you flip it over, it's got three concentric circles on the back of the disc. All right. Ah. All right. It, this far went as far as at least the tradition appears, along with the horn feathered serpent going with it, went yeah. as far as the southeast. All right. So these are concepts that may have made the. I'm not saying the Pachenta went that far, but
but at least the ideas went that far as well. Yeah. And the uh, traditional um, staff or stick that they used the, the, for to uh, set the center of their ceremonies was a white stick with three circle with three lines, red lines around it as well. And you'll see that in the art in the in the uh, the, the yeah. art as well. So do you yeah, have to show, oh, yeah. you have a picture of the back of the disc with the three circles. Yes, can I do. Show that image right now. I, I can pull it up for you in one second. Yep. Do you want to see that, Ken? I'm sure you sure you do. Sure. Yeah. In one second. And you guys, you know why why there's why is three? Mm -mm. Go ahead. Think think about three because that took circles. Okay. The 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 biggest one is summer solstice. It's the longest day. The next inner one is equinox. It's midway. And then the smaller one is winter. Now, if, if that's arcs. And where does, uh, and so, but these are circles. Where does the sun go when it sets? According to Hopi, it goes into the underworld and it does exactly the same thing. So the middle circle is winter. The middle, middle one is equinox and the bigger one is summer. So that's why there's three. For the so three. Visualizing the sun's journey and it's, it's sun. Uh, and it's continuing in the underworld and come back up. Yeah. That yeah, is yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow. I got it right here, actually. If I can okay. share it. Fire it up. Let's see what yeah. you got. All right. Um, can you see it? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there's the uh, front of the disc, and there's the back of the disc, and it has the three concentric circles right there. Yeah. Right. Super cool. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, wow. yeah. Emron's research is uh, a YouTube video on our website. You're welcome to visit that as well and, and give you more insight into all uh -huh. these types of. How many notches are the, in that circle? 17. 17 bifurcations on the outside. And the finger points directly due north. When it's point directly due north, the, the line between this eye and this eye makes a 60-degree angle for the summer solstice. Mm -hmm. cool. And the lines that are coming off the knots hit the major mi minor standstills for the moon. And the, uh, the positions of the heads also work out to the positions of star constellations for Big Dipper and Cassiopeia. I mean, literally, it's all laid out there on, on the disc as a full. Taken a reproduction and stood out there to, to verify it in uh, in real time, real life. Yeah. 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 And so you can take down your slide now, and then we'll go ahead and do a final closing here of the, of the presentation today. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Cam, for joining wow. in. And uh, always, uh, we look forward to hearing more. It's good to celebrate our ancestors and to uh, see how wise they were and sophisticated and their high tech of their day, uh, far more than we generally give it credit for. Yeah. Thanks for all the good work that so you those are, do. So thank you so much, Cam. I know that you, uh, you're you yeah. very busy, especially this weekend. This is a big deal. Yes, yeah, this know. is Solstice weekend. This is, his, this is, his we work, appreciate this this. is a working time for him. Yeah. So we thank you. Any last words? Uh, we're, we're buying a new building. We're expanding our museum. Four times over. It's about three blocks down from where we are today. And next weekend, we have a, a virtual fundraiser for, uh, we got Mata Artis pottery, jewelry, a whole bunch of stuff. So if anybody wants to check it out, we're at uh, verdevalleyarchaeology.org. And you can get a link to that. We'd appreciate All right. It. Thank you so Thank much. You.